Hi everyone, welcome to the second Kaiser School workshop for this semester. So today we'll be doing automation with Python and is conducted in collaboration with the Statistics and Data Science Society of NUS. So um, this workshop will be conducted by Chris and Hital, who are both here. You guys can wave or something. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, I'll leave it to them to continue this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. Yeah, so for now, let's just wait for another two minutes for people to stream in yeah, before we start. And okay, so um, for recording purposes, uh, or rather if you're asking about the recording, the recording will be distributed onto, or not distributed, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And then you guys can take a look after the entire event is done. So it will be probably up to the evening or so. Yeah, after the workshop is over, we'll send all the registered participants an email with like all the materials. So uh, no worries, we'll give you all the links, uh, also provide the slides for reference, as well as the answers, the suggested solutions to all the code so that you guys can explore on your own. All right, I'm gonna start now. Yep, so no worries about the slides and materials. Again, um, if you are if you want to read ahead for the slides, I, I can send the link in the Zoom chat. So basically, these are the set of slides that we'll be using today. And yep, this uh, set of workshops are basically part of a larger set of workshops that's organized alongside NUS hackers as well as like NUS statistics and data science society. So basically, to, in collaboration with NUS Statistics and Data Science Society, we at NUS Hackers decided to like come up with a whole set of workshops that's related to Python. So we start off with like intro to Python, which happened last week. So I think most of you guys who have came from the workshop last week, and we will start to like you know use the skills that we've learned with of like Python and like um to like do different type of tasks. So today we're gonna be covering automation with Python and the next few weeks we're gonna like uh, cover more about like numpy and pandas and as well as like data visualization in python and r plus uh, tableau so uh there's one other workshop that's not listed here which is a uh, next week's workshop next week's workshop is about creating telegram bots with python so we will talk about that again later um nearer to the end of the presentation but that's the workshop that's happening next week so uh, if you want to learn about how to create telegram bots with python that's happening next week as well so yeah uh just to give a brief recap about what hacker school is about so hacker school is one of the main initiatives that nus hackers runs and basically what we are trying to do here is want to get you started on programming and making stuff so that you can get uh move on to start on your own projects so um, like our goal here at NUS Hackers is to like spread the hacker culture to show everyone how easy it is to like make and build up build stuff so that you guys can just like solve your own problems like um, basically make your lives better so by, by building stuff so hacker school is definitely one of the main initiatives we go about to do that so 
like I said, there's a whole slew of workshops that's, that we have organized this uh, semester and today we are at Automation with Python. So, um, yeah, just to give a quick introduction about myself today, um, it, today um, there's like me and Ethel. We are both like year three computer science students and we are both of us, we are core team members of NUS Hackers. So today will be the ones that's covering the workshop. Uh, later on, we will start off with Ethel talking about, you know, a few pretty interesting things that he, that he did with Python with like image manipulation. Then following that, it will be me, Chris. Uh, I'll be talking about like a web scraping with beautiful soup. So basically that's just the name of a library that we'll be using. So yeah, today's workshop objective, objectives is basically we are going to continue where we left off from the previous workshop. And we're going to like introduce some common Python tools and libraries. And we're going to learn how to do some useful things with Python. So it basically builds on the knowledge of what we learned last workshop. So just want to show everyone this comic on the right. Basically this comic is like, I think it's an XKCD comic that talks about automation. So basically it talks about, you know, Sometimes you spend a lot of time on this task. Maybe I should write a program to automate the task. So in theory, how you expect it to be like is uh, uh, you work, you write the code to do the task. And then when automation is done, you end up like freeing a lot of time for yourself and you end up not doing a lot of work. Basically, you're just right running the automation. But actually what actually happens most of the time is uh, like um, you want to automate something, but uh, as a result, you just end up spending a lot of time writing and debugging the code, and you end up like trying spending a lot of time writing the automation code that you actually don't have time to work on the original task. So that's like a pretty funny comic that actually represents most of the time what happens. So the basically when we want to automate something, we need to consider whether you know the time taken to automate something is worth, like it is worth the time to automate something, or not. Yeah. So. Yeah, so next we're going to set some expectations for the workshops. Um, basically, I want to first like talk about what really is automation, right? So um, for me, when me and Ita, we, dis we designed this workshop, we thought, you know, it was really difficult to come up with a workshop that everybody can relate with because we find that automation is a very personal idea, me meaning that something that... Um, works for me, something that I, I can automate might not be something that's directly applicable to you, right? So it's, that's, it's very difficult to come up with like a very general use case that everybody will be very pleased with because all of us have different tasks, all of us have different requirements. So what we are trying to do this workshop is we are trying to like talk about some of the real life scenarios where we have to use Python to help us to automate certain things in our lives respectively in in Chris's life and in Ethel's life. And we are trying to like talk about what problems we are trying to solve. And we, and although it might not be directly applicable to you, uh, what we are trying to teach here is really the skills that's required to like perform those tasks and hope. And we hope that you know that you might find some use case in your life that you can apply those skills to um, automate certain things in your life. All right. So um, the key thing is like Python would help you to mow your floor or feed your dog after today's workshop. It's really up to you to think about what problems you need to solve and like use that to use Python to help you. And eventually just want to remind everyone that we are not a coding bootcamp. So we are not aiming to be comprehensive. We're just aiming to, you know, like dive deep into the cool stuff and just show you enough within this short few hours of time that we have today so that you can be interested enough to like explore on your own and perhaps build something that's useful for yourself. Okay, so to the outline of today's workshop, basically uh, we are gonna be covering like uh, third party work packages, like how to use third party libraries. And then we're, and something that we didn't cover last week uh, with regards to Python is basically things like Python objects and classes. So we're gonna run through that as well. And then uh, Ital is gonna be talking about reading and writing files, bug image manipulation, and for me, I'm going to be going through about web scripting with Beautiful Soup. So yeah, without further ado, I'm going to pass on the time to Ital. Ital will be going through the next part about Python packaging. Okay, all right. So I'm going to let Ital share his screen. I'm into some window management. 
Okay. Um, can can everyone see my screen? Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Um, yeah, we're talking about, so like the default Python comes with like the a, quite a batteries included kind of like standard library, but at the same time, you do need a lot of uh, third party library packages to do more of your stuff. Like say, if you want to uh, read PDFs, if you want to like uh, write to Google Excel sheets. So like sometimes when you do like automation, um, you have to uh, install third party packages. Um, so there's two, in Python, there's two main package managers that people use. So like the first way is to use pip that usually comes along with the default version of Python. Um, sometimes it doesn't come installed, then you just have to like sudo and install it. And the other way is to use conda, which is like, um, so conda is like a more heavy weight than pip, I would say. And, um, it comes with pros and cons. Like the pros is like, um, so it ships like pre-built binaries. So like, um, it's a lot easier, and it does like the version, like the dependency version checking a bit, a little bit, a little bit better than pip. Um, but it's also a bit slower. So like, yeah, because it does all this uh, version checking like a bit more like accurately. It's the when you install something, like it might be a bit a bit slower. And also like Conda comes with like some kind of environment management also. So it's it's not the like it's not like a one-to-one -one, like can compare with PIP. Yeah. So and sometimes the packages kind of conflict. So um you have you just you kind of just have to pick like one and like stick with it. Yeah. Um okay, so installing Anaconda. Um I, I won't go through the install in this because uh in this workshop because we'll be using Google Colab. Um, but basically what I can do is to, uh, if you, if you are like have, if you have time, like after the workshop, you can like visit this uh, website and actually I can just like, um, click on this. I, okay. I, I'm in full screen, I, uh, but basically you just go on the website and like, um, scroll to the bottom and you, so there'll be, it was all the way at the bottom. There's like three, um, three OSs and just pick like. If you don't know what to pick, like just pick the 64 bit x86, it should be the correct one. And if you're on Windows or Mac, there's the GUI instructions. And uh, if you're on Windows uh, and you don't want to add, and you want to use like Conda in your uh, terminal, then you just like, yeah, you want to use the Conda command in your terminal, then you take like the add Anaconda to path. So you don't have to do, do it manually. And then if you're on using Mac or Linux, there's also option to use command line. So it's a bit faster if you are familiar with it. So you just like, uh, you download the, this like dot sh file, and then you just like uh, have to run bash and then dot sh, and then you just like have to press enter a few times to skip like the terms and conditions, and then you like just like uh, type yes or no to like accept some instructions. So yeah. Um, okay, so next I'm talking about, I'll be continuing when we left off like last workshop about um, so uh, a rough overview of like what's objects and classes in Python. So like an object is just like a, a programming term for like a bundle of related variables and functions together. So like it's basically like, yeah, bundling functions and variables that are related. So um, there's a bit of jargon regarding this. So like in, norm in, normally, in normally when we talk about variables and functions, they're just like variables and functions, but if, the variables and functions are bundled in an object. They have a different name. So like the variables, they are called like attributes instead and the functions they'll be called methods. So um, in Python, everything is an object. So like even like basic data types like integers and strings. If you look at like, if you go to the like the IDLE, you can like type dot and then you can press tab and then you actually see like all the, all the methods and their attributes. So like for example, if I declare like, I is like, if you go to 45, so that's an integer. I have like, immediate, like even though this is in some languages, this is just like a primitive data type, but in Python, this is an object that's like, uses like, has like attribute, like numerator, yes, like method, like dot upper. So oh, dot upper is for, is for the string. Yeah, so that's the, like the Python, just a Python thing. Um, so the object is like, uh, so this object is like an instance of a class. So it's an instance of the integer class, right? So 
object is like an instance of the blueprint. Like class is the blueprint. So a class is like, uh, when, you, when, you, when you define a class, it's like uh, you define a blueprint for creating the object in the future. So um, usually you don't really have to create any new classes when you're doing your automation or when you're writing Python in general, um, because you usually just like, use like some third party library that writes the class for you. Um, so we actually won't be writing any classes in this workshop. But just as an example, um, this is how it looks like. So usually class names are capitalized. And so the classes need an initializer. So initializer, initializer basically tells the class like what attributes need to be set when the class instance is created. So the initializer comes in a special format. So you have like this underscore underscore. It's like a magic, it's known as a magic method in Python. So uh, yeah, the initializer is always this method name, like underscore underscore in it. And then each for for all the Python uh class methods, right? As like, for all the methods in this class, you just notice that they have this self keyword. So actually, this self keyword, um, I mean, it can it, technically you are not constricted to using self. It's just like a, it's like a, it's just a coding convention to use self. So like, why is there a need to use self? Is because like in Python's implementation, the instance attributes and methods, they are, how they are passed is, they are passed as the first argument in this, um, in, in each method. So if you want to ins in, like in, refer to like the, the object instance itself, you have to use, like you have to, usually in most languages, you call self dot something, but in the self in Python, you have to pass in manually, like as the first argument. So if you're in it, yeah, you forget to pass self, like, and then you call init with like, say, say, let's say you forgot to pass self and then you call init with two arguments, they will actually throw an error, like saying that you have uh, too many arguments, like there's only, he's only expecting like uh, one argument and then, yeah, but you're giving two arguments. So, uh, so actually when you're calling the, when you're calling like the, this method, you do not include like the, the self, like you just include the two, the two arguments after, after self. And then so for like for description also, like you just call it with like a bracket. Like you don't you don't have to pass in self. Python does it automatically for you. Um, yeah. So when you, this this is a constructor. So like uh, how, basically when you create a in this case you can create an instance of a dog. You pass in name and age, and then you set the instance attributes of name and age to what you just passed in, like in the in the initial initialization. So like it's a bit weird. Like if you if it's the first time looking at class. Uh, constructors, is, it looks a bit weird, but basically it's, it's saying that I want the argument, I want the this argument name to be assigned to the object instance attribute self.name. So, yep. Uh, and then like th this class also has some like uh, methods that comes with it. So it will return like, say description returns like this string that's like uh, self.name is self.h years old. And speak is just like this, another string that's formatted this way. Um, yeah, so as you can see, when you create object, there's the self, uh, the first argument, you don't have to do anything. You just pretend that it's only two arguments. So here you create object with Charlie and H2. And then when you, when you like assess the methods, the self dot, okay, uh, the, the, the class description is here. So the automatically when you assess the description, the self dot name and the H, yeah, you can, you'll it, it, be able to refer to the instance attributes. Okay, so uh, next I'll be talking about reading and writing files, which is actually quite a common routine in uh, not just automation, but like uh, every, everything in general. So, uh, okay, so just like a bit of background, uh, like about five, because we'll be dealing with file paths. So, um, I'll just briefly walk through like how file paths work in different OSs. Um, so Windows uh, uses back slashes and the Mac and OS and Linux, they kind of use the forward slash. And if you write like a, I mean, if you just write a, like your automation for like your own personal use, then you don't really have to care about this. But um, like if, 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 if you like use like a backslash or a forward slash in like uh, as a hard coded string in your, automation, then like someone else use in like a different operating system, 
then it might not work because of this. So, which is why that, um, like we are, we are introducing this library called like Pathlib in the you know, like, uh, next few slides. Yeah, so, yeah, but first there's also like this concept of relative and absolute path. So, uh, absolute path start at the root directory. So the root directory in Windows is uh, usually like C, C drive or something. Uh, and for Mac and Linux, it will be slash. So that's the root directory. So if the path does not start at the root directory, then it will start at the current working directory. So the current working directory is usually the folder that you ran your program from. Yeah. Um, so that's the relative, there will be, be the relative path. Okay, so um, in Python, there's uh, this library to uh, like handle paths and like um, working with like files and like, yeah, so it's called pathlib. So um, usually if you're reading some of the older code across the internet, sometimes they use like uh, os.path, but that one is like, um, it's not as, like it's not as, it's considered not as Pythonic as using pathlib and also like, the 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 namespace OS is like quite cluttered and like yeah you should try to use Puffy instead of OS .puff if possible they kind of can do the same thing yeah but this is like the so called more Pythonic way to do it um so Puffy has this uh import that's like this object called uh path in capital P so like remember that classes they start with a capital usually um yeah and then usually like if it's like a if the import you're importing a function, it will probably be in small capitals. So, uh, so how you create an instance of the path is, uh, so let's say you want like a path that like, uh, like, okay, this is like not like a common folder name, but yeah, if you have your eggs folder in your bacon, your spam, then you can, you want like this output, like slash spam slash bacon slash eggs, then you just like uh, include it as arguments in the path, the constructor of the path. Okay, so like some uh, ways that usually you will create paths in pathlib. So uh, if, you're, if you want to have, re have a path that's relative to your current working directory, um, there's path has a dot current working directory method in it. So, okay, so you see like you have all these weird slash inside. So like it, when, when you're dealing with a path object, right? The slash operator is like overloaded in the sense that if if you have a slash and then and then it one of the operate one of the operands is a path object, um like the slash object, the, the, the slash operator actually performs like differently than it normally does. So you actually like concatenate a string and a path or maybe like two path objects together. So that's how you can contact that's how you can like kind of kind of like concatenate like a path object and like strings like in, in this in this manner. Yeah, it's because like the this this uh, slash operator is overloaded, but because like the order of evaluation, so like the first two operands are evaluated first. If, if these first two are strings, right? Like you will just throw some error, like, like slash doesn't work on strings. Yeah, so the first two objects, one of them must be a path object. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, in this case, if you have just strings, then it doesn't work. It needs to be a path object. Um, okay. And uh, there's also another useful method in path that's like, so very common use case is you want to grab all the files in uh, like a certain directory that match a certain pattern. Like maybe you want to grab all the JPEGs in a, in a directory. So this pattern is usually like a regex string. And so how, you, how, how it works is like, is, the, is you just glob and then like followed by the regex string. So if you want everything you can write, uh, just like put put star and if you want like a certain file extension you can like star.jpg or yeah something like that so and then it will return you a a generator so not a list like a generator of the so a generator is basically like a list that's not like exhausted yet so you if you want to like like use it like in a regular python fashion you just cast it to a list first, like yeah so uh yeah, it, it will give you a generator and then like of all the uh, file paths that are in the current directory. So um yeah, so you can glob specific types of path if you want to like glob 
uh, like all the text files, you can you do this way and then you'll get all the text files in the directory. Um, yeah, so a couple of other useful methods to check. So like uh, sometimes you want to check whether the path exists and if the, maybe the path doesn't exist, then you want like, maybe you, the path doesn't exist, then you create the, the path and counting. Kind of so you can just have a dot exist method. And then so you can check whether if it's a file or it's a directory. Yeah. So, okay, so writing to files, um, Python has this inbuilt uh, open function that takes in two arguments. So first is uh, the, the path to the file that you want to read or write. And the second one is the, the mode that you're opening the file in. So you can open them usually like, for most of the time you either open in read only or you'll be open in write mode. So write, just overwrites the, if this existing file, write will overwrite the existing file. So that's why it's like useful to check if the file exists in the first place. So you don't accidentally overwrite the file. Um, yeah, so, and then there are some other couple of modes like append, like uh, maybe like read binary or something. Yeah, so um, yeah, but usually you just be using R or W in the second argument. And so after you open, uh, after you open this, it will return you like a like a file handler, and then this to to this so you assign it to the this uh variable f, and where you the variable f now you can like you can dot write, or you can dot write lines, you can dot and then after you write you is is like consider good practice to close the file so you don't like, uh because it's not to it's sort of not hot resources and like other programs can like read and open the files if they want. Yeah, but this is like not the considered the Pythonic way to read and like open a file and close it. It's like, so this is like the more uh, standard syntax. You have this with open as f. So what happens is within this code block, within this in indentation block, the file will be open. And after the indentation block, the file will be automatically closed for you. So anything that you need to do, like read or write in the file, just like do it within the code block. Yeah, so uh, like if you're reading the file, uh, instead of like this, you just change it to uh, R and then like you can like dot read and like this, I think there's also dot read lines. The difference is I think read lines are separate by the slash new line. Yeah, so depending on your use case, you might want other one. Okay, so um, yeah, I will be going through the notebook demo. Okay, so, okay, like, right. Uh, the notebook is at, this link, um, I will, I will copy in the Zoom chat. Oh, um, yeah. Actually, actually, let me put this Zoom chat in a different. Oh, oops! I I PM someone. Okay. Uh, let me let me send it to everyone. Let me think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So it will bring you here, and if. Because this file is, uh, this collab notebook is uh, view only. If you want to like save changes, you have to create a copy. And, uh, but otherwise, if you just want to run, you just need to sign into a Google account and you can run the code blocks. I will maybe like just pause like a few seconds here for everyone to get on this page. Okay. Um, yeah, but for those of you who are already here, um yeah so in collab so like it might look something like this when you first come in so uh you can have usually i can expand this sidebar and then like um yeah, so so okay so currently i have uh all my stuff here already but uh if you're just starting out on a new notebook uh you might have to okay so some, some of the data that i, I i've I've, that, that, the, that this notebook will be working on is in this, uh, this Git, Git, GitHub library. So you have to Git clone it. So uh, in, in Collab, you can, or in Collab and in Jupyter notebook, if you can just like uh, put a, a, a exclamation mark to like run it in the command line. Yeah, so this should, this should Git clone this, this library and then it should appear here. Yeah, so. Um, okay, so like, I will first I'll import the part the, the libraries. So like this I will be using take time and like path. 
Um, so I put in, I import these two libraries and then so okay, so actually the first okay, the first task is like I want to like let us like say I want to have I have a certain like text files, I want to like uh add a date to all the text files, but I don't do it like manually, like open each one and then like copy paste the date, that kind of thing. So uh in so like how, how the text file looks like is like so in here there's like data. And then I'm not sure if I can open this in Colab. Okay, I can open it. So like there's some like Lauren Insum here. So I want to add a date to the first line. So that's the, like, the first thing I'm trying to do here. Um, okay, so first I try to specify the, the path that's to the data, which is this uh, automation Python data and then the stacks. So um, yeah, I, I, I will come here. And oh, is I'm actually already executing in this. Okay, I, I guess I didn't really hard refresh this notebook. Okay, but and then so if you uh and then so now if you check what's this uh uh variable notes directory is uh slash okay, so like yeah, the first level is slash content. Like slash content is the current like working directory, I guess, and then automation with Python and then data and text. So now I want to grab all the file paths that end in .txt. So I use this uh, .glob. And then because this is a generator, if I want to work with it easily, I want to con convert it into a list. So I just like use the inbuilt list function. And, and then this will give me a list of all the paths, which are like these four nodes. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to add a date to it. So um, I use the date time. I use the date time uh, library that I, I, I imported earlier. And then there's this uh, method that's called dot today. And then this is like string string format time. So uh, I want the today's today's date time formatted as uh, date, month, year. So running this, they will give me uh, this, this date string, which is nicely formatted. Um, sometimes, Okay, so there's actually this uh, Python library called Arrow that's like, I, I, I think it's more like, it's, it's easier to work with than date time, but you have to pick install it. Um, yeah, and so sometimes this date time, like sometimes, uh, maybe there will be problems with time zone or whatnot. Yeah, but, but, but if you want to like have like, if it's your own project, I would recommend just installing Arrow and like working with that instead. Yeah, but I mean, this is in a stand library, so like it, it's it's easier to like just use it off of the bat. Um. Okay. So. Uh. First, I'll insert all the. Uh. My next task is to insert the date in the first line for all the text files. So I will um. I will create an output directory first because um maybe I don't want to overwrite this in case like there's a bug in my code and like. Generally, it's a good idea to like create a copy instead of like overwriting. So I want I create a, a like a path to like where I want to output. So in this case, I want to output to the current working directory and output. So um, so okay. Then after I will make, I'll make the directory. Uh, and this is like this. This is like a so if. Okay, sometimes in Jupyter notebook and also in Colab, you can mouse over the the. Um, the method to like look at the documentation, but in this case, there's not a lot of documentation. But sometimes there's there's more. Uh, yeah. So this parents equals to true just means that uh, I will create like it's like a recursive make directory. So if like I've uh if I don't have this uh directory, I will create this directory. And if I don't have this directory, I will create this directory. So like yeah, you you won't go and complain like oh this directory doesn't exist. Yeah, but in this case, I already have the I already have this directory created already. So I won't go and uh, create them again. Okay, actually, I, I, let me just go and delete this. Yeah. Oh, okay, I can't delete this. Okay, uh, never mind. I'm, I'm not gonna spend time deleting that. Um, okay, so for, we recall that we assigned the four paths as like, uh, like this four paths to the nodes. So for each of the, so if I want to like, for each of the file paths I want to open and I want to add a date and I want to write it like this is one way of doing it. I just like for file path and file paths, like with open 
SF, I, I text equals to, so I assign the contents, I read the file and I assign the contents to a variable called text. And then um, in the next, afterwards, afterwards the file, the original read file path will be closed and then I open up the write file path. And then, okay, so this is like, the output directory is just a directory, right? But then I need to have the actual file name. So I, the actual file name is actually, uh, so in, in the file path, the, like the, the dot name, right, basically refers to this, the last part of the, so this, this is the dot name. So I, I want to like join this name with the output path, which is this, this path. So this is what I'm doing here. And, and then afterwards I found out right so I found out right, I, I, I do some string concatenation. So I, I format like today's date followed by a new line and then plus the following text. Yeah, so after you run this, um, what you should get is like, there should be a new, like the first line should be a, the date, current date here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just as a, Second example, um, so like just the second example, so like uh, of this like kind of automation example. Um, so sometimes like uh, let's say in my in my like sometimes I have my modules, I need to write my essays, and then like maybe I like overuse a certain word, and then like um, I want to like paraphrase that word to something different, so I don't like have too much of the same word in the essay. Um, yeah, so this is just a workflow that, I, that you can use to like check what's a word count for like the different kinds of words. So in this, oh, I need, do I have to, okay, I think, I think NLTK is installed in the Collab. So Collab is actually installed, I have, I have a lot of pre-installed libraries. Uh, so if I do this, yeah, it will straight away work. But if you are on like your local machine, you need to pip install NLTK. So um, NLTK is basically like a NLP library for uh, dealing with, um, basically, I'm importing NLTK here to deal with stop words. Um, so stop words are like common words in English, like say of the there, uh, if like the those who kind of grammar words that don't really mean anything. So I don't want them in my word count because like they they will probably appear quite often, and then like um, I don't want them to be at the like uh, have be at my top of the list. I want like the actual words that have like meaning. Yeah, so, um, so if I want stop words, right, I have to go and download this, um, go and download some, some of the data using NLTK. And okay, so after I this import, I'm going to import a uh, counter from collection. So collections is in a standard, standard library and counter is basically like, uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's like a class that can easily let you count, like count like, instances of stuff like easily la, like they don't have to go and like write like more lines of code uh, you'll see the why later yeah so and afterwards i'll be uh using uh python i'll be, I'll be, I'll be using this uh library to read uh docx files so that's like microsoft doc document microsoft office document but uh i need to go and install this library so uh, you can pick install using the this this command after I install, I import docx. And so from, and then after I from, I import like certain imports from NLTK. So like NLTK has also this like method called like work tokenize, which like helps you to split the words in your text, like into like words. Like, so sometimes you, if you split it manually, you can use like dot split. But the one like sometimes there's full stops and like uh, uh, punctuation marks that you don't really want. So this one is like a, a slightly easier to use version. All right, so um, this dot x right. Uh, so I, I have this method which I this method basically I got it from Stack Overflow. Like usually when you uh, like working with Excel sheets or whatnot, you just try to like find some answer that like usually not try to find like try to find some way that has worked for other people in the past and just copy and don't like reinvent the wheel. So how about you do it is just Google. Um, maybe maybe there'll be an example code on the documentation or maybe it'll be on the stack overflow and you just copy the code and like 
maybe you can like format it a, a bit to like as, a, as to how, how you like it to be formatted but yeah in general you don't have to be like writing new code that like possibly may or may not work like don't, re don't reinvent the wheel so um uh, by roughly how this works is uh i pass in a file name and then it will create this document class like uh, you create an object that's like a document object from this file name and then so this document object it has it has this attribute called paragraphs so each paragraph has a probably has its own text then i have to go and like append the paragraph text to the this full text and then i will join so these are like this is like a list of paragraphs but i want like a single string so if i want a single string i will just like concatenate them with uh, a new line yeah so this is roughly how it works um yeah so like i just i included an essay i dropped my essay like, so if you want to try this with your own like uh office document you can just like drag and drop your doc x file here and then like change change this but currently i have this um like this essay that I wrote in year one that uh, yeah, I just dropped here. And then like, I'll be using that to like, as this example, but yeah, you can try it on your other documents. Um, yeah, so stop words. Um, stop words, so, okay, so, so I, I have this uh, list of stop words and I cast it to a set. So the reason I do this in cast it to a set is because I want to check if an element is in the set. So if I check an element is in the list, it's a, it's a lot, it's an ON operation, which is a lot longer than if I check if an element is in a set, which is why I cast into a set. And so afterwards, I initiate a counter from the collections class. So counter is kind of like a dictionary, but it's like a little bit easier to use. Um, yeah. Um, and then afterwards, I tokenize the, the, the text raw, so like the whole... Um, that, that, that whole chunk of text as a single string that I, I, I tokenized, that I read, I read from the docx just now. And so, okay, so, so these words will be, okay, I, let me just run this first. Uh, actually, let me just create a new cell to just show you what's this like. Um, okay, where's my, okay, uh, yeah. Let me split this in two. Um, yeah, so, Okay, I need to move this upwards. Okay, so yeah, this words is basically uh like a list of all the tokenized words. Yeah. Okay, so let me just quickly move on. Um so from these words I can see like uh, there's some punctuation there and like this um also there's stop words. So I don't want the punctuation of in my word count. So uh in Python strings there's the Inbuilt method that's called is alpha. So if the word is purely alphabetical and not like uh, some punctuation or some number, um, yeah, then, then is alpha will return false for if, if in that case. So but if if I want to just alphabets, then I like I want to check if the word is alpha, and if the word is not in stop words. So step because stop words is a set, so I can use this not in syntax. So and afterwards I increment the counter. So this is just like a dictionary. So like uh automatically. If you do this in a normal Python dictionary, um, I, I, I think this will have an error because like you did not have the keyword inside yet. But uh, because you're using this counter, uh, if, the, if the word doesn't exist in the dictionary, you automatically create, like you create a default entry like this, this it's called zero, that starts with zero. Yep, so you run this. And then afterwards, I want to check. Okay, so I, now I have a counter of the word. So, um, I have a counter, so the counter probably looks something like this. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so it's like something like this. It's not, it's quite messy still. I don't really want to like look through this manually. So this is what the next line is for. I want to sort it by their word count. So counter dot I so counter is like a dictionary. So in, in Python dictionary, there's a dot items uh, method that you will return you a uh, a generator of the key and the the key and the uh, and the value. So in this case, the key is the word and the value is a count. So 
in this in this first part, right, I'm creating a list. It's a list comprehension. So I'm I'm creating a list comprehension of like uh so for 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 the key and the value in this dictionary, I'm gonna create a tuple that's uh the count followed by the word. So the reason I do that is because um I want I want it to yeah, I, I want it to sort by the count instead. So if like I don't I don't I don't I'm so, because I'm sorting it by count in reverse order. So I don't need to sort by the alphabetical, the word of alphabetical order. So I, I put the count first in this tuple. So and then afterwards I want to sort it in reverse order because I want to see like the, the the highest count one first. So okay, this is like quite a long list, but yeah, here you go. Uh so this is an essay about colors. So like there's a lot of colors here. So like there's some mobile and like a lot of so there's a lot of use of users and like maybe I want to like um find a different word for that and so like applications. Yep, so this is what this does. Okay, um yep, okay, I'll uh, move on to the last uh task in this. So um uh, this is just like a like a workflow to like sort out your downloads folder. So if you're like me, your downloads folder probably look like quite messy. Like uh let me just quickly show it. Like it's like uh maybe there's like a lot of nonsense going on. Yeah. So um okay, so I if I remember correctly, in Mac OS, there's actually like uh they also have this grouping function. I, I think Windows also has this grouping function to, to group it. But um, like this, you don't have to use it, this for your downloads folder. You might use it for like maybe uh maybe the grouping doesn't really suit your needs. Maybe you have like a more, like maybe you have a like code files that you want to group or something. So, um yeah, so you can you can do it. Uh, you can, you can create a workflow to do it. So uh, okay, you specify the path to your downloads folder, and then uh, you have a mapping to what the extension and the folder the 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 folder name that you want to store all these extensions in. So, and then you just like, uh, for each file in this, uh, in this folder, in this folder to sort, I clock everything. And then I get extension. So the extension I can get from, because this is a, this is a path from the pathway library. So it has a dot suffix attribute to it. So I get extension. And so if the extension is, in this mapping, I will have uh, so I'll create a destination. So the destination it will be this folder, and then in this folder, uh, followed by the like the extension mapping. So the the value of the extension mapping this dictionary. So I will create the destination here, and then if the destination is the de if the destination already exists, uh, then I will just not make the directory again. But if the de destination doesn't exist, I will make directory. And then after that, I will rename. Rename is basically like move. So I will move the file to um, this new destination. Yeah, so uh, this, this rename comes from the, the, the pathlib library also. So uh, it comes from, you you move the file to this new location. It, it's not like you, you don't have to like open the file or, or anything. Yeah, so um, let me just do a quick time check. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll quickly move on to my next section, which is about image manipulation. So um, just to recap, um, so like PNG files, um, they kind of like, so okay, so like how images are represented in your computer. So like um, usually that's, it's RGB or RGBA. So like PNG files, sometimes they use RGBA. And so it's basically the amount of red, green, and blue and then alpha is transparency. That, yeah. So in a certain pixel, the amount of uh, red, green, and blue alpha in a certain pixel. And um, usually this is like from a like from number from zero to two five five, but sometimes it's also like a des like a float from zero to one. So yeah, each of the individual pixels has one of this <coughs> uh, one of these values. And then, um, so if you're working with images, chances are you'll be using uh, Pillow in the Python images library. Yeah, uh, the original uh, library is called PIL. Uh, yeah, but then I, I think uh, it was like discontinued and then someone like uh, restarted the project, which is why there's like Pillow and PIL, but actually they are the, like, the same thing. Uh, but 
when you install it, you install it as pillow, but then when you import it, uh, you import it as PIL. Okay, so you can, if you don't have it, you can just install, but it, it should already come in Conda and should already be in Jupyter Notebook. Okay, not in Jupyter Notebook, it should already be in Collab. Um, yeah, so how, okay, so in pillow, the image, so there's some like idiosyncrasies in this like way they represent image and their coordinates. So I just like go through the concepts first. So image pixels, um, they have like so it's it so in PIL it's like a it's like a two D array of image pixels. Each pixel is like RGB. Uh, so image pixels have x and y coordinates, but so the x coordinate works like as what you would expect. Like if you go to the right, it's the x coordinate gets bigger. But the white coordinate is like inverted. So it's like, as you go down, it, the value goes from zero to like the, the, the height of your image. Yeah, so it's like opposite. I, I don't know why they decided to start this way and why not like just start like here, uh, but it's just the way it is. Uh, I tried to Google for answer. I did not find one like, like easily. So yeah. Um, okay, so wait, you want, so another concept is uh, this, box tuple concept. So when you want to crop images, usually the, you provide this tuple of uh, the left coordinate, top coordinate, right and bottom coordinate. So let's say I, I have this original image here. And then so these are the, like the X and Y coordinates like in the PL format. So let's say I want to crop to like this black square here. Then I will, what I'll do is, so it's left, top, right, bottom. So the left is three, the top is one, and then the bottom, I say the right is nine, and then the bottom is six. So that's, that's what I will do here. All right, so uh, now I will go through the next notebook demo, which is y'all can assess here. Uh, I'll just pause for a few seconds so that y'all can get, your, oh yeah, let me copy this link into the chat. Oh, oops, oops. Yeah, and I'll give everyone a while to get onto this notebook. Okay, I'm continue. So this new notebook, you probably see something like this. Um. Okay, so I think I for me I I already have the data here. So, but if you don't, you can uh git clone this again because the different notebooks they are like yeah they they won't share the data. Um. Yeah. So same thing as just now, I import pathly and then uh I now now I import this pillow library which is called pil in the import. I import this image class from the pil library. And. Yep. So um in, in the next task, I just want to uh do some simple image transformations with the data. So the data is in um this like this cat. I'm not sure if I can open this. I think I can, yeah. So it's, it looks like this. Um yeah, so I, I, I want to provide a path to this image. So it's 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 this path like automation data images and then cat. So like you want to open an image, it's very simple. You just call image dot open, and then that will uh, create a new this from from the file path. You will just like uh, create a, this image for you, and then if you check the image, you it should open like yeah. So you can open it. In, you can you can view the image in Jupyter Notebook also. Yeah. So actually, what I, I think what what this underlying lying this is like a array. Yeah. So. No, not an array, like, like a like a two D array of, um, like say the, say the uh the height, the width, and the, like the the, the each of the pixels. And then so um uh, you can check the, you can check the size in this like uh so I, sometimes you want to like say you want to crop and you resize you you know the existing size so like there's this dot size that comes with the first uh, first the first uh, the first number is like a uh, the width and then the second number is like a height. So it's, yeah, it's, so it's, it's useful to know which one is, which number is which. So um, some simple image transformations you can do. Um, 
So you can rotate the image. So yeah, if I'm not wrong, I can mouse over this to yeah. So like see the documentation. So um, rotating the image uh changes some of the pixels a bit. Like it has to uh, resample a bit. So resampling there's this resampling filter here that you can use. Uh, if you want things to be a bit more high quality, you can use like a bicubic or like a uh, okay, but here there's only bicubic. Sometimes there's length, length zones or some uh, more expensive filter. But the default is nearest. It should work. It should, it should work for the fast, quite fast also. But maybe maybe not the highest quality. And so you can rotate by the angle. The angle is given in counterclockwise. So if you want to rotate it clockwise, I have to put it negative ten. And then yeah, some other arguments that I don't really want to use for now. So yeah, if, if you use like your Jupyter notebook or your or your collab. You can usually like uh, just like quickly mouse over to look at the docs, so you don't have to like, you know, like uh, switch between tabs to like look at the documentation or like try to find the documentation in the first place. So it's quite useful. Yeah. So in this case, when I rotate, it should. So I, the rotation is not a mutation. It's a. It gives you a new uh, instance of the image. Yeah. So I have to assign it again. Yeah. So. Now I have this rotated. It's, yeah, as you can see, it, it's not very pretty. So like you in real life, you probably want to zoom in after you rotate. Yeah, so yeah, which is what I'm doing it now. So I'm gonna crop it. Uh so if I have this box tuple that like uh is the is is uh what is the box? What's the box tuple for me again? Like left, left, top, right, bottom. Yeah, actually, do they document it here? Yeah, yeah. So they they they, they do tell you that the uh, this box is like left, upper, right, lower. <laughs> yeah. So wait, I'm not sure why they have. It's a different left, upper. Oh yeah. So upper is top. Yeah. So upper is top. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I copy it. And yeah. So now it looks. Now now it's rotated, and it looks like. A normal image again without this black color uh, border. So if I want to save it, um, I create the output directory. Okay, uh, but I, I in this case I already have this output directory, so uh, it, it it will show me some error. But if you run it from your collect notebook, it should not have this. Um, yeah, and then I I, I save it. So this image I can just there's a, this dot save method inside it already, so I can just straight provide the output path that I want to save. And it should be here. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. So like the last workflow flow that I'll be going through is uh resizing images in bulk. So this is like a common workflow if you are doing like uh say machine learning, you have you are working on like some um, image data, and maybe you want to send the image data from your local machine to like. Uh, like some cloud GPU server and like maybe the image previous image data is like quite big if you have a lot of images it might be like gigabytes or even like terabytes of data so and, and then some of the images because like the the input to like uh, say um, your model maybe there's like uh, it's, it's a certain size input that maybe like it's like 200 by 200 input then there's no point having a higher resolution image it's, it only takes more. You need, it's only gonna take up more space, and like you have to do like resizing as you train, which is like extra CPU bottleneck. So usually you want to pre-process the image before you, um, do all the training. So like this, is just like another use case. Yeah. So, in this uh example, I want to resize all the image, all the images that have a height or width, law larger than two hundred pixels. I will resize the longest dimension to 200 pixels. So uh, yeah, so in, in, the in the data folder that should, inside the car, there should be like about 50 images. And check them out. So they are pretty high quality. So usually, uh, I mean, it depends on the model you're trained, but I would say that this is probably quite sharp and like maybe not correct resolution for the model you, you might be trading because usually most models they if this this, this amount of pixels it will be too uh, expensive but you can also use some filters to like do it do it also yeah like convolution filters to downsample it also um but 
yeah, let, let, let's say you want to downsample it and like to reduce the file size and like um so to make it like easier, faster to copy to like because you're probably using SCP to copy the files, it will be faster if you the, the size is smaller. Um yeah, so I have this max dimension 200, and then I for I, I get all the JPEGs in this uh in this folder, and then I use image.open for each of the paths. So okay, this image path is a path flip object, but uh, the PIL library can work with path flip object also. But some of the sometimes the third party libraries that you work with, you might have to convert the path flip object to a string. You just call like string in that instance. Yeah. So but in this case, it works with path flip objects just fine. So you don't have to do it. But sometimes, yeah, it's a it will throw an error and because you didn't convert it to a string. Um, okay, so you image not open and then so if any of so you recall that the image size is like a like a tuple of the height, the width and the height. So if so the max basically chooses the biggest number out of the out of these two. So if the biggest dimension is bigger than the max dimension, that means the image is too big. And then I would resize it. So I resize it by this ratio, uh, 200 divided by this uh, max dimension. So in that case, when I multiply back the max dimension, I get 200. So the max dimension will become 200. And then, uh, so in Python, you can, I can unpack, I can unpack uh, uh, this tuple in this way, like width and height. So I get a uh, new width, new height, I can multiple assign it as a width times ratio and height times ratio. So this needs to be an integer because it's like, it's like you can't have like half a pixel in an image. So, yeah, I cast it to an integer. And um, after that, well, afterwards, I, I have this new width and new height. I just call image.resize and it will automatically resize for me. So if I'm not wrong, I can... Can I review the documentation for here? Okay, I don't think I can because... Uh, so Jupyter Notebook, I have, to, I have to have an instance of this image. So this variable has to be assigned first before I can view the documentation for the instance methods yeah, so currently this image like I, I did not run this code yet so it's not going to show up like what this documentation is yeah so um yeah it, but if, if you run this image on a, a, a different line then you can you can look at this and it should probably give you the documentation as just now so i i recall there's uh, some other uh, arguments to this like the resampling filter and some others but yeah we cu currently we can just use the default one because we're not too picky about it and after you resize the image, you uh you can't just image dot resize because it's not a mute it's not a mutation on the original image. You have to assign it to the instance, you assign it to the variable again if you want to mutate it. So uh so after I assign it to the uh, image, I will save the new image data to this uh output directory slash uh, the the original file name, which is this image one dot com uh, dot, dot jpeg. Yeah, so if I run this, okay, uh, image directory is not, okay, I did not run this. Uh, yeah. And then now if I look at my output directory, I should have the data. So sometimes the, the collab, uh, if the, like they don't update these files, yeah, if the files, they are not updated instantly, you can just click on uh, this to refresh, yeah. And then now if I look at this, yeah, now it's like a lot smaller. And if I look at another one, yeah, they are all resized properly to like a small 200 by 200, I mean, like the maximum dimension 200, yeah. Okay, so that's all for my section. Um, next, I'll pass on to Chris, who'll be talking about web scraping with beautiful soup. All right, I'll stop share. Yeah, so... Uh, right now, we're going to open up another um, collab notebook. But uh, for now, because I, I think what Ita went through just now was quite a lot of content. Uh, you, you guys can just spend three minutes like taking a break, but no worries. After you come back, we'll be like starting out on another new problem that's completely new. So, um, yeah, I'm going to just uh, share my screen and give you guys the link to the collab notebook. And for now, you guys can go for a three-minute break if you need to.
Hang on, I'm still sharing my screen. Yeah, it's this link here. So I just sent the link in the Zoom chat. Uh, we'll be we'll continue at eleven o eight. All right, I will start in around 15 seconds time. All right, I hope everyone is back. I'm going to begin now. So basically today, this task that I'm going to show is uh, something that I've actually used personally and I just want to like um, drive the importance of what I said earlier, the automation is personal. It really depends on like the problem you're trying to do and like what you're trying to automate. And sometimes the problems that we I face is not the same as the problem you face, but a lot of the times the skills that we learn are transferable. So I hope that today the skills that we're learning, which is web scraping, is able to like uh, help you to perform certain tasks. So I just want to like uh, quickly talk about what web scraping is. So web scraping basically is about, um, suppose like if I go to IMDB, right? And suppose I'm a data scientist and maybe I have my job requires me to find out what are the top rated movies. So um, if you didn't know Python, some, what you would do is you probably got, like go to the IMDB's page and then you go to like, uh, let's see, where's top rated? Um, top box office, maybe, you know, top rated movies. You probably like, go to top rated movies and then you fire up like your um, Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel and you just copy paste one by one. But because you guys know Python, you can actually do something that's like way smarter, which is you, you do something called web scraping, you write a program that analyzes the web page. And then from the content of the web page, you're actually able to like get like the, the list of like uh, top rated movies just by writing a program instead of you having to do it manually. So that's what we mean by web scraping. Basically, like we use Python 
to go and read a web page. Then after it's, it reads a web page where we take the information that it processes and like package it in some way that we can use it to solve our problem. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk about the motivation of the web scraping problem we, we're gonna do today. So basically um, what happened was that I was taking one of the modules in school. So, you know, in certain modules you have to do like um, group work. So uh, this, this story is gonna sound kind of silly and you guys might laugh at me, feel free to go ahead. But basically like in my group, there were certain members that were not contributing at all. And I wanted to, and I ended up doing a lot of work, right? So like, you know, group work, when your team, there's certain team members who like do nothing, you end up, you end up having to like do more work. And I wanted to like, um, you know, prove to the lecturer that, you know, this guy really didn't contribute much and the rest of the members did a lot more work. So something I did, which is uh, quite interesting is, that I actually use Python to export the, to read the chats from a Telegram group. So from my, from my group's Telegram chat, we will, I, I actually use Python to count how many messages each member sent, okay? And what I got was this, this result over here. Okay, so this is Python. And what I got was, um, like I sent 330 messages in the group chat, but that guy that didn't contribute anything, he only sent 66 messages. Then using Python, I was able to plot a bar graph of like how many messages each of the members have sent. And I actually sent this entire PDF to like um, the lecturer of the module. And I ended up getting a good grade for the module. I don't know what happened to that guy, but that's basically something that you can use Python to do. So imagine if you didn't use Python to solve this, you will actually have to like, you know, open your phone, look at your telegram and just count every single message one by one. So that's something that can be easily automated with Python. And that's uh, how, uh, that's the context of what we're going to solve today. All right. So back to the slides. Yeah. So next up, I'm going to just do a notebook demo. Um, but yeah, a notebook demo of like what we're going to do today. So my notebook is here, all right? So this is the notebook that I just sent everyone the link to just now. Uh, basically what, uh, what's gonna happen is that I'm just gonna go through this notebook and yeah, so basically we're gonna use Python to help us count who sent the most messages in the NUS hackers chat in the public chat group. Oh, Shu Fan just told me that there's a trick that you could go about doing this, but well, uh, well, I never tried that, but I guess I'll try that after this workshop. But I, I guess the skills is still transferable, which is like web scripting. So uh, in, in case you guys don't know, we actually have like an NUS hackers chat, public chat group, and you are able to like um, just download the chat, exported chat logs, and we are able to do some text analysis on it, right? So I'm going to show you how it's done. So over here, we have this NUS hackers chat, all right? This NUS hackers chat is... Uh, Basically this group chat that we have, we have like uh, a lot of members in it and we talk about, you know, our events and like random NUS hacker stuff. And if you use a Windows computer and only a Windows computer, so if you, if you use a Mac or you use Linux, you just find a friend who has Windows and just ask them to help you to do this because only the Windows Telegram client allows you to export your chat message. Uh, I'm sorry that this is slightly small, so I can't actually, let me see if I can make this bigger. Oh, I can, uh, but no, it's, it's not really helping much. So, okay, this is my, this is my Windows machine that is like, um, that I have somewhere. So this Windows machine, if you use the Windows Telegram client, it has this function that's called export chat history. Okay, this doesn't exist in like the Mac and the Linux version, but it exists in the Windows version. So if you click on it, okay, you can basically choose to like export your entire Telegram chat. Okay, like you can choose to include your photos or videos, but today we are only concerned about the text messages. So you just like choose the options here and then you just click export. And what it does is it will basically export all the messages in like the NUS hackers chat. So um, I chose the NUS hackers chat because, because it's a public group. In fact, any of you can actually just go to NUS hackers chat and export the entire chat history at the moment. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to wait for it to slowly be done, but essentially what you get out of this is, um, hang on, let me just figure out how to get out of this. 
yeah, what you get out of this is you get this whole list of exported files. And inside these exported files, basically like there are files you can open up in your browser. So uh, it's a bit small, but uh, just bear, bear with me for a moment. Over here, like there's this messages, messages two, messages three, but they are just files that are open over in your web browser. So you just open with like your web browser. In this case, I'm using Firefox. Um, what you will see is you will see like the your the Telegram chat that's being represented as like a web page. So over here, basically all the messages are here, and basically today we are gonna. Okay, I see that Ubuntu has that. Okay, thanks for like checking that. I just checked on my Mac client, it doesn't. So yeah, um, yeah. basically what you get is this web page that you can use Python to help you to analyze the text messages. And that's what we're going to do today. Okay, so um, let me just put this in one of the tabs here. And yeah, so I've already exported the entire chat and uploaded it, it to this like GitHub repository here. So if you visit this GitHub repository. Uh, you don't have to visit it now, but I'm just gonna send it to the link to everyone in the Zoom chat so that anyone who's interested can just visit it. Uh, but you don't have to visit it, you can just follow what I'm what you're seeing on my screen. So if you, I uploaded the chat log for that we're using for today's workshop to this um, GitHub repository. Basically all the files are in it already. I already exported and uploaded it here. So. Uh, if you want to download the file, you can just cl click on code and download zip. So if you click on code and you download zip, basically you download every file that's inside this page and you'll be able to see like what I see over here. All right, so next we are going to go back to the notebook and basically when you run this command, git clone and you clone like from my repository, this is a public GitHub repository, that's how you can clone from it. Uh, what it does is it will just download all the files and after it downloads all the file, and, and this command is done running, if you click on this folder here, you will basically see all the files downloaded inside here. Okay, it's in the hacker school folder, and inside the hacker school folder, there's a web scraping folder. Inside the web scraping folder, there's a chat export folder, and it has all the files over here, and they're all HTML files. Okay, so um, now that we've downloaded the file, we are able to do certain things to it with Python. Okay, we like we can just use this uh, glob. It's a built-in Python library that helps us to isolate the HTML files that we want to analyze. Okay, so if we were to just glob all the files inside the folder and we put over here, there's this thing called star.html. So star HTML basically tells us we want every single file inside this folder that ends with the file extension, HTML. And if I were to print this out, what you will see is we have all the files over here that Python has found for us. And if I were to just get the length of the exported files, you see that you have 22 files over here. Okay, so um, after ever since the NUS Hackers Chat was created like around two years ago until now, we have like ended up collating 22 full files of messages. Okay, last year when I ran this workshop, there were only eight files. This year when I ran this workshop again, there's 22 files. So um, let's just look at how the one of the message files look like. So when we look at one of the message files over here, basically this is what Ital covered earlier about opening files and just like reading the contents of the files. So I'm gonna just print the first 20 lines of the file. And what you see over here, basically, you see this type of like code-ish type of thing, okay? So this, what you see over here is actually called HTML, okay? It's called HTML. And I'm just going to jump back to the slides and uh, just to give uh, all of you guys some domain knowledge about what HTML is about. All right, so HTML is this thing called a hypertext markup language. Markup language meaning that it gives you presentation, it presents information in a way, uh, just, it, it just helps you to present information, okay? It's not in any way a programming language. HTML doesn't offer you things like if else or like while loops. So it's not a programming language, okay? And it also gives website structure and content. So if you are interested to learn more about HTML, we have a HTML CSS hacker school on week eight. 
So that's going to happen like a few, like around um, five weeks from now. But in the meanwhile, I'm just going to quickly run through what we need for this workshop about HTML and CSS. Okay, so for HTML and CSS, you can just follow my screen. Um, basically, it, it looks something like this. Okay, so HTML, uh, it, it just has this bunch of text that uh, show you how content looks like. So over here, this is over on the right is what you see here. This is the preview of like the HTML code on the left. So suppose if I were to add like another paragraph, so P stands for paragraph, I can just put like a yet another paragraph. And if I close this tag and I save it, this third paragraph will show up, okay? So if I can even do things like uh, add like a ordered list and, and inside this ordered list, I can add um, certain items. So LI stands for list item. So inside this ordered list, I can have like first item and you will see like a numbered list because it's an ordered list, first item and like, I add a, another list item and for this, I'll say second item, second item. And it will be numbered number two. But if I change this OL to UL, so UL means it's an unordered list, okay? Unordered list, sorry, um, wait, it disappeared. Uh, unordered list. And this two, number one and two, it will, it will just end up being like a bullet point. So. I hope this gives you an idea of like what HTML is. HTML specifies the presentation and the structure of like web pages. So every single web page that you see, every website that you visit, it uses HTML in some form or, or another. So uh, another thing that I'm gonna cover now is, okay, I have this style over here, okay? This style over here. This is called uh, CSS, basically it's a, uh, it helps us to define certain styles that we can we can reuse. So over here, I had I have defined a style that's called my red text. And if I were to give this class to certain HTML elements, it will just set the color to red color. So for example, if I set this paragraph and I give it class equals to my red text, okay, and I save it, you see this is a paragraph turns to red, and I can actually reuse this style for like even um, items of different types. So this H1, it means heading one. That means it's a big header of the page. So this, right now I've applied my red text to the header as well as this paragraph here. And suppose if one day, you know, your, your client or your boss tells you, oh, I don't like the color red anymore. And I want to change it to like blue. Okay, I can just change the color to blue. And suddenly, because of this reuse over here, you see both of this paragraph as well as the header. From red, it turns blue. All right, so I hope this gives you an idea of what HTML and CSS is about. So let's um, look at, um, let's look at the exported data here. So this exported data we, that we exported from Telegram, it's also using HTML. So let's, let's look at this. I'm gonna just right click one of the things that we are looking at here and we click on inspect. Okay, so you can you can do this on like Google Chrome or, or Safari or like uh, Firefox. All browsers support this function. Just right click anything that you're looking at and click on inspect element or inspect. And it will actually just open up your browser developer tools. So this is gonna be a bit scary for people who are looking at it for the first time, but no worries, we'll just follow through it. Okay, just follow what I'm looking at. And let me just make the my developer tools bigger. Okay, so over here, what we are seeing is basically, um, if I were to mouse over the body element, it, the whole thing turns, turns blue, right? But I'm only interested in one of this message. So if I were to look at one of this message, it will just highlight, okay, right now it says, it, it shows my name. But if I were to just like look at one of the parent elements, so this is a child element, if I look at the parent element here, this div, okay, it actually highlights the entire message. So if I were to go even higher over here, you see like message one, two, three, four, five. Uh, yeah, um, and basically it's highlighting, highlight, highlighting it message by message. And over here earlier, I showed you something. I said like, um, 
there's something that's called class, right? So earlier in this example, we had this class thing. So I, I can apply certain styles to it to determine how it looks like. So when the Telegram developers, they were trying to create this uh, exported chat log, they also made use of something similar. You can just, they define something called class equals message default. And every message that has these two, two classes, message and default, they, it actually helps them to like determine how this is presented as a web page, like in the web page itself. So this message and default basically gives um, the styles that show how it should be represented in the web browser, which is why it looks like a message at the moment. Okay, so back to the notebook. Um, sorry, the teaching copy here. So basically right now what we need to do uh, we kind of figure out that to analyze this chat log, we need to get the messages that has like this message and default CSS classes, message and default CSS classes. And we want to look at each of these messages. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to use this Python library that's called Beautiful Soup. Beautiful Soup is like one of the, is probably the most popular like third party Python library that helps us to pass HTML files. So, uh, uh, HTML is something that's separate from Python. So Python doesn't understand HTML file by default, but we can use a third party library to help us to analyze HTML files. And that's Beautiful Soup. So uh, Collab already has Beautiful Soup installed. So just from Beautiful Soup 4, we import Beautiful Soup. And then um, because we've already downloaded the files here, we can just use Beautiful Soup to open one of the files here. So um, when we try to like uh, solve a problem that's this big, we always start off by like trying to solve a smaller problem first. So the smaller problem that we're trying to solve here is where we want to analyze just one of the HTML files instead of all 22. We just start with one first. And this is what this line is doing. Beautiful soup, open just one singular file. And we'll open the file in read mode because we are, we are only reading the file. We don't need to write to it. And I assign it to this variable that's called soup. Okay, so we are going to try to start with something simple. Let's try to figure out who has spoken in the chat before. So if I were to look at this and I were to just look at uh, one of the names here, okay, right click Christopher, go inspect. Okay, I realized that over here, this CSS, this line of HTML actually corresponds to this name and it has a class called from name. So that's where we can start with. Okay, I'm going to just select this HTML class, this CSS class that's called from name. Okay, and basically this will print you every single um, HTML element that has this class that's called from name. And over here you see you have like Francis, NUS hackers, myself, and a whole bunch of other people. And it's still a little messy. So let's just really try to extract the names. So over here, this actually gives you like a whole, um, I'm just going to print out the type of this, so type. And it actually gives you a list of HTML nodes, okay? Uh, of HTML elements, it gives you a list of HTML elements. And we are just going to try to like look at the second element, okay? Let's look at the second element and what we get from the second element here is Christopher Go. So if we want to extract the content, we can just get like the contents Okay, and right now the contents of this HTML element is, it has just a list of one item. So we'll just um, get contents of zero. And if you get, get contents of zero, you see like there's this long string over here that has a lot of white space around it. And we don't want, we don't want the white space. So we'll just do a dot strip. All right, so over here, that's how we actually programmatically analyze the file and we actually got like my name. Okay, so if I, if I were to get like a different HTML node, suppose instead of number two, I, get, I look at number three. What you actually see here is NUS hackers. And you suppose if I put look at number six, you will get like this person whose name is RY. Okay, so now that we're we are able to figure out how to get like one person's name, we can actually get everybody's names, okay? Basically, this is what we've learned from last week. 
you are looking at like this, um, we basically select every single from name element and then we are just looking at each this contents and then we strip it. And this is a list comprehension. So when we run this, you see a whole bunch of names. All right, so basically this, this is everybody's names who have spoken in the chat before. And right now they are all in order of the messages that has been sent. Okay, and if you look at this, you realize that there's a lot of duplicates. There's like Christopher Go, Christopher Go, Christopher Go, because it really just lists all the names of that, that has appeared in the chat message in order. So next, we actually have a challenge now. So I'm going to give you guys five minutes to just like uh, digest what we have seen so far. And maybe you want to like try to export your own chat. That's fine as well. Um, and, but what I want you guys to do here is basically you realize a lot of these names are repeated. So the, so the first challenge here is we're going to try to get a list of unique names in the chat. Okay, so that's the first challenge. And the second challenge is how do you count how many unique names you have? So just spend some time trying to try these two challenges out. And after five minutes, I'll just go through them. So right now it's 11.31, we'll, be, we'll continue at 11.36. Uh, if you don't want to attend this challenge, no worries. Just come back at 11.36, I'll go through this. All right, so five minutes from now.
All right, one minute left. Okay, so just uh, look at my screen. I will just go through how to do it. So actually the answer is really simple. And uh, yeah, uh, over here, what, what I said, what I showed you guys earlier, you had these raw names. And these raw names basically had all the names of everyone who has chatted and their respective like messages, like in, in the order of the messages that were sent, right? So it had a lot of duplicate names. So because this is a list of names, which is why it has duplicates, if you want to just get the unique names, there's actually just a very simple thing that you can do to just get the, the unique names, which is just convert it to a set of all names. So a, a set in Python basically is a data structure that doesn't allow any duplicates because a, a set cannot have any duplicate elements. So we, if you convert it to a set, basically all you get is, uh, okay, wrong variable name. Let me first, the name of the variable is called raw names. Whoops. Okay, raw names. All right, so when I just convert it to a set, basically all you get here is just the all the unique names of all the people who've, who's, who appeared in this HTML file. So for me to get, to count how many unique names that you have, it's very simple. You just need to get the length of the raw names and you and there's 56 unique names that appeared in this file and that's it for these two challenge but um yeah so like some of the the people in the chat they gave some pretty interesting solutions which you use like counter and stuff which um yeah those those will work as well so but the simplest solution which I, I i just showed you guys it kind of just works as well okay so next uh, now that we managed to use Python to help us count how many people have spoken in our chat, chat group, uh, that's, not exact, that's not actually what we want to do. That was actually just a short introduction to the powers of beautiful soup, right? So let us get back to our task. We need to count how many messages each user has sent. So if you were to look at just the raw names that we saw earlier, do you think that we can just count everybody that exists in like, like the, the order that the which that people have said and, and we'll get the right number of messages. Meaning that can I just do something like uh from collections import counter? Yeah, so this is the counter class that Ita was talking about, and then you can just do like counter of like raw names. And yeah, so can you just do something like this? And from here, can you just tell how many messages everyone has sent? So if you just think about it, and you might think that, okay, this might kind of work, but it actually doesn't fully work properly. And, and I'm gonna explain why. This doesn't fully work properly because over here, okay, uh, my name has appeared here, Christopher Go, And I actually sent two messages. And over here, my name appeared again, and I actually sent two messages again. But if I were to just count the occurrence of the names, I will only have been counted as like uh, only sending two messages instead of four messages. So I actually sent four messages in this screenshot, but if we follow that method that we saw earlier, I will only have been counted as only having sent two messages. All right, so what we actually want to happen is we want to count that I've sent four messages, okay? So we need to change our counting strategy here. Okay, basically we, instead of trying to look out for the names, we also need to combine it with looking out for each of these messages. Okay, so like this is a message that has a name. This is a message that doesn't have a name. Message that has name, message that doesn't have a name. So we need to change the, okay, let me just go, let me just look at the, this slide again later. Don't worry about that. So, um, like previously, what I said earlier is that 
we can actually look at every single messages by, uh, okay, let me just look at the example that we saw earlier. Where was that? Um, hang on. This is, yeah. So this is exactly what we were looking at earlier. So if I were to look at this message here, this message doesn't have a name but it has a time stamp to it, right? So if I were to just inspect it, okay, we see that this actually has a message default clear fix join. But the previous message that had a name, it has message default clear fix. So right now we actually have a strategy for us to determine whether this message has a name or not. So those messages that have a name, they'll have this join property here. Okay, but there's also another way we can look at this. Basically, we know that every single message that appears, if they have a name, or regardless of whether they have a name or not, they'll have these two properties, message and default. Right? Message and default. And that's how we kind of, um, we that's, that's how we form a strategy for us to like approach this, this problem. So over here, I'm just going to select all the messages that has message and default. Okay, and I look at the first three messages, Basically, um, it, it looks a bit messy. So when this, it looks a bit messy, we'll just uh, try to clean it up a bit and just look at just one message, okay? So if you were to look at just one message, okay? I, I, item number two, which is like the third item, okay? This is how it looks like. So we have uh, initials, we have, um, we have my name here, and then we have the from name that we saw earlier. Okay, and we have this text here that says like, what's the content of the message? Okay, so from here, from this one message itself, because this is the this is like this uh, parent HTML element, I can actually select like the child element of this parent HTML element. So if I just do one message and I select from this element, I can actually get like the name. And from what I saw earlier, from what we did earlier, we can actually just extract out the name just by getting the contents and like processing the string a bit. All right, so uh, for every message, we can actually print its sender over here. So over here, I just, I earlier I ran this all messages thing. So this all messages thing, just to recap, is actually this soup.select and we selected all the message.default. So this all messages essentially, essentially contains every single messages that have a that has a, a occurred since like the start of this HTML file. And then if we were to just like uh, loop through these all messages and we just print out the names, okay? If we were to try to print out all the names that occur, what you realize is that Python actually gives you an error, right? So at first it was Francis, NUS hackers, Christopher Go, then all the way until YCX, then the list, then there's an error. So why, why is there an error happening here? So let's look at this, our data again. So at the start, we have Francis, NUS hackers, blah, 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 until YCX. So, uh, okay, actually it's a second instance of YCX. So let, I'm just gonna scroll down and until we see YCX again. So why is Python showing us an error here? Because over here, it has, this, this message has a name but when it tries to print out the second uh, message here, this second message doesn't have a name. So we are trying to extract the name from a message that doesn't have a name. And when that happens, Python is angry and they say, oh, you're trying to you know, extract a name, but the name doesn't exist. That's why the list index goes, goes out of range, right? So um, essentially what we, are, we can try to do here is we can just look at this. And what you'll see is like, um, if we were to just not print out the rest of the stuff. So over here, the difference here is over here, we message the select from name and we print out the rest of the stuff. But over here, we don't, we just try to select the from name. And what you see here is for those messages that don't have names to it, they actually just have like a blank uh, array, blank array, blank array. Okay, so next, what we want to do is, uh, we can actually do some processing to it, okay? So basically, uh, we will try to select their names. 
And if we cannot get the sender, if we cannot get the sender, that means this message has no sender. But if we can get the sender, then we'll print their name out. Okay, so I'm going to run this cell. And what you see here is, Oh, whoops, I scrolled too much. Uh, what you see here is uh, the names of the people who send the message. Then over here, you see someone send this. Someone send this over here. This was actually sent by YCX. And um, suppose you someone send this. This message was, was actually sent by David Chu. So right now, the next challenge here is, let's try to change all the someone send this to the last seen name. How do we do this? Uh, we can just use our Python knowledge to help us do, to do this. And uh, try not to scroll down because uh, after, if you scroll down over here, you actually see like the answer. So just try to look at this. And from here, we're gonna just do a small exercise to try to change this, someone send this to the last seen name. All right, and we'll have like another three minutes to try to solve this. So we'll continue at 11.49. All right, so right now it's 11.49. Let me just quickly go through like how to do this. So yeah, this is the same code snippet as, some, as just now. So if I were to run this, it would just say like someone send this. But I actually just want to use it to reflect the last name that I saw, that, that I've seen, right? So that I've seen. So over here, actually what we can do is if the message has a sender, then I will just keep track of who was the last seen sender. So I'll just store it in a variable. And if, if the message has no sender, 
instead of printing someone send this, I will just print uh, last seen sender. Okay, and if we were to do this, basically all the someone send this will be changed to like the actual like last seen name. All right, so like I said, a lot of the things that we are doing here, a lot of the cleaning of data is not like something that's magical. We are basically just falling back on our programming knowledge that even for those of you who just attended the workshop last week, you'll be able to do, just fall back to your programming knowledge and you'll be actually, actually just be able to like do some data cleaning like that. All right, so now that we actually have this, uh, we actually able to like isolate the names and tag every single message to who actually sent it. We can actually proceed to count it. All right, so um, first let's convert the names to a proper list of names. So the difference earlier is we printed the names out. So instead of printing the names out, we actually want to add it to like a list here that's called all names. So these all names, earlier we printed it out, but instead of printing it out, we'll just append it to the list. So it's the same thing as what you saw earlier. And if I were to just run this, we have a Python list of all the names. Okay, and uh, in fact, if we were to just like run like counter on it, right? Counter, it can actually serve most of the purpose that we want to do already. Like it, it actually counted that earlier uh, that I sent 16 messages, but earlier the one we saw, it actually saw that I, I sent like 11 messages. So like right now it's, it's actually giving an accurate count of how many messages each person has sent. Okay, but uh, let's just, but in this case, we are not going to talk about counter because we want to keep it simple for now. So yeah, the, we just need to like, let's just do a sanity check here and just check if that the, le the length of all the names is uh, equals to the length of all messages. And it's true, which means that we were able to successfully tag all the messages with a name to it. All right. So now that we have a proper list of names, uh, how do we count them? Uh, yeah, so actually we could have used the collections counter like method that I've showed you guys earlier, but uh, there's this other library that I want to introduce to everyone that's called Pandas. So uh, actually the two weeks later, we are having a workshop on like data wrangling with Pandas, but Pandas is actually a very popular data wrangling library in Python. It can help us to like do a lot of this stuff like graphing data or like, um, batch processing data. You can think about it as like an Excel. I said that this Excel is very powerful and it's in Python and it can allow you to like do a lot of things to like rows of data or like columns of data and etc. It can even read like Excel files. It can read like CSV files, for example. So I'm gonna just import the pandas library and then I'm just gonna create a pandas data frame. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna go in depth into what a data frame is, but basically it's, you can think about it as like a spreadsheet of data. And in this data frame, I'm just gonna load it in with all the names that we've counted earlier. And if I to just print the data frame out, you can see over here, suddenly you have like a nice spreadsheet uh, type of thing here that actually like, uh, that allows you to click on it and uh, interact with it. So we have like 991 rows and one columns of data at the moment. So next, now that I actually have this data frame, okay, I can actually select just this specific column here. So if I choose data frame of row zero, or, sorry, a uh, column zero, okay, what you actually get is you just get the names itself. This like a like this data frame zero is you, you just you just get the specific column itself. And if I were to just run this method called value counts. Okay, we actually get like what we saw earlier. Okay, right, we get a sorted um, name as well as like a count of how many times it has occurred. So the person who has sent the most messages in this chat, the first file messages on HTML is YCX. Second guy is Hao Wei who sent 123 message and I am over here with 16 messages, right? So that's basically what we did. Uh, what, we've, what we've done for the very first file and imagine if you didn't have Python to help with that, you'd be just reading every single message, you'd be counting them yourself, and it would be very tedious, but Python has helped you to solve all that. All right, but are we done here actually? 
we've achieved our task. But you know, we can't possibly just show our boss this, right? Because uh, probably our boss, uh, you know, they like things to be more visual. They want to show this to their clients, put it in a presentation slide or something like that. So because um, Pandas is so powerful, it actually helps us to have a method that helps us, helps us to just plot a bar graph. Okay, I can just call value counts dot plot. Okay, and I can just specify that I want a bar graph. And if I were to just run this, suddenly you see this bar graph of the names as well as the messages over here, and you, it's all sorted. Okay, then suddenly, then your boss will be very pleased with you because you have a visual representation and you know people like that, then they can use it in their presentation or whatsoever. All right, so this is just a brief introduction of like what you know, third party Python libraries like Pandas, they can be very powerful. They can abstract a lot of the things that can be very difficult for you to do, like plotting graphs. Okay, if I were to just want to plot this graph manually with just pure Python, I actually have, I might have to write like two or 300 lines of code. But because somebody else has already written the Python code to plot graphs, I just need to do it in one line, dot plot, and I get a bar graph, okay? So next, are we done yet? And of course the answer is already here. Like everybody sees the answer here. So we actually only did it in like one out of 22 files. We only analyzed messages.html, but you see over here, we actually have like uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way until messages22.html, right? So, you know, if you were doing it manually, you were just counting the messages on your phone, this is where you panic and you give up because uh, you already spent like one whole night trying to count the messages in one of the files and suddenly you need to do it like 22 more times. But because we are using Python, it's so powerful for us to just repeat the same thing 22 times. All right, so back to what we saw earlier. Earlier, we actually downloaded the files and we globbed them and exported messages files has the file names of about 22 files over here. Okay, so basically we just need to modify our code slightly to just look at every single one of these files. And that's the modification we have to make to make it work. Okay, so same thing over here. We have all the names, uh, all names. This is just a list that helps us to keep track of all the names across all the files. All right, and uh, basically we, we are just doing it, we are doing the same thing. We are doing the same thing as just now, except that we are repeating it inside this for loop. Okay, this for loop, basically what it does, okay, I'm just gonna print the message file. And if I were to just run it, run it, it will just print out the, all, the, all the files over here, right? But instead of just, but I don't just want to print out the, the file path over here. We want to like process every single file. So the first step is of course, we use beautiful soup to open up the individual HTML file. So I'm just gonna go out and copy my own code earlier. And we have, yeah, sorry, we need to go up quite a bit. And over here we have this. So open up every single file. Okay, and we are gonna just open up, instead of just specifying the file path here, I'm just gonna open up the message file. Message file, and we are gonna select all the messages. So for us to select all the messages, right, basically we can just go back to like earlier and we can just basically use the same code as we did earlier to just like get like the, to select all the messages. So, uh, hang on, I'm actually like, I, I don't want to scroll up and down because, because if not, you guys would be like, kind of like dizzy from everything, right? So I'm gonna just copy it here. So again, just soup dot select and we just select all the messages that we've seen. And we just put it in a variable called all messages. And of course we also want to do a sanity check. So we, we actually have a message counter here to just count how many messages we've processed so far. So we just message counter and we just add the length of all messages, okay? So this message counter store the count of all the messages across all the files. But over here, we're just adding the length 
of all the messages in that one singular file. But because it is in a for loop, it will be, it will be repeated. Okay, so we also want to process every individual message and get the names and add it to all names. So basically what we're going to do here is the same as what we've been doing just now. And we are just looping through all the messages, okay? All messages, we look through every single message, we extract the name, and then we append it to all names. All right? And Earlier, we saw that we had like, I think around how many messages? Let me just scroll up and look at it. Um, we had length of all messages. We had, sorry. Um, yeah, I accidentally added this thing. So we had 991 messages. So if our code works correctly, we should get a few times many, many times more than 991 messages. So I'm going to go back down and... Then I'm going to run this. Okay, so it, right now it's reading every single file one by one. And at the end, we have 21,154 messages. Okay, so you can see Python is kind of efficient with this but because we use Python to help us to read all the files within like just less than 10 seconds, it actually processed all 22 files. And in all 22 files, we have 211, sorry, 21,000 messages, okay? And the message counter, of course, is 21,000. So again, the sanity check is to check that all the names that we affected is the same as the number of messages we have. And this case is true. Okay, and, we, and since we actually extracted all the names out, we just had to do the same thing that we did earlier. Again, do the value counts. And of course, now, um, because we have all the data from all the different files, the data has changed slightly. And I can just actually plot the bar graph again. Over here, we have a lot of names. And over here, this bar graph actually, yeah, this bar graph is super long because these are all the people who have ever chatted in like the NUS hackers chat. So um, if you think about it, there's a lot of potential in like applications like that. So yeah, actually that's, we have come to the end of this problem, this task that we're trying to solve here. So you can actually see you can spot your name there. And if you don't spot your name there, then of course you can like join us in our Telegram chat, at NUS hackers chat, then uh, you can just, um, you know, the next time, maybe one year later, when I teach this workshop again, if you were to have sent a chat message, your name will actually end up being here. Okay, so great job on completing this. Okay, there are other cool things that we can do with this. So imagine, because now that we've already processed the whole chat in Python, it's actually possible to generate the word cloud of the messages. Okay, you, you can just find a Python library that helps you, helps you to do that. Okay, you can also generate a chart of the group's average chat activity at different timings. So you can figure out if, you know, most people send messages to the group, maybe in daytime or as opposed to like at nighttime. Okay, so my guess here is that NUS Hackers chat, most of the time, the messages only appear in the evening or like in the middle of the night because that's when most of the hackers in the chat, they are like, uh, you know, they are awake. Okay, and in fact, you could even like feed all the messages that is in the group into a machine learning model. And then your machine learning model can actually like try to talk like an NUS hacker. You can use things like Markov chains, you can use things like GPT-2 and train the NUS hackers chat messages with it. And then you can just make a machine that speaks like an NUS hacker, right? So there's many cool applications that we can do with this like web scraping thing that we've just did. Okay, and yeah, so back to the slides. Uh, and it is 12.04 now. So actually, uh, this workshop was planned for three hours. So I can, I can, I can actually cover more content here. I actually, um, um, I actually hit these two slides. So there was actually a use case a while ago where I actually had to download lots of YouTube videos, okay? Um, so I'm just going to quickly show you how to use Python to download a lot of YouTube videos. And everything we're showing here is just a technical demo. We, NUS hackers, we don't condone like, um, 
any form of copyright misuse or infringement. You know, if you want to like uh, download people's music, you should actually like buy it properly or use Spotify or something along that lines. But we are going to just showcase a technical demo here. Okay, so uh, there's this notebook over here that's called, uh, I'm just going to send the link in the chat. So, so what happened was, um, this was actually something that, uh, that occurred to me. So the problem statement here is, uh, perhaps imagine like, uh, like some, some, some um, relative that doesn't really know how to like, download music or like uh, get their own music collection going. They don't know how to use Spotify and they only know how to use YouTube. Okay, perhaps they send you a whole bunch of YouTube links that he found while browsing YouTube. And then he, he asks you, because you are like the, the, the techie in the family or like because you are young, you know how to use a computer and you just think that, oh, this guy must know how to download YouTube videos. Then they ask you, can you download YouTube videos for me? And of course, the next thing you tell him is, no, that's illegal, that's copyright infringement. But then, of course, as a curious hacker, you try to explore the possibility of doing so with your newfound Python skills, right? So actually in the same repository earlier, I actually had this uh, text file that has a bunch of YouTube links, okay? And today what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to see if in theory, is it possible for us to use Python to help us to download this whole bunch of links, okay? So next, what we're gonna do is, um, where's my notebook? It's here. Okay, we're gonna just get clone this again. And inside this collab notebook, what you end up seeing is the same files that we saw earlier, but of course there's that youtube.txt. Um, where is it? Let me just refresh it. Yep, okay, inside this hacker school folder, there's this youtube.txt. And if I were to just print out what the file says, of course you see this few YouTube links over here. All right, so um, now that we have a file with like a YouTube links, we can actually just pre-process them into a list of links over here. So um, I can just run this and you get this whole list. This is a Python list of like YouTube links. So like some, some of the people were mentioning in the chat that they can use YouTube DL. So this YouTube DL actually comes in a Python library as well. So you can just pip install YouTube DL. And if I, if I were to just run this, then like the collab instance will just download like this YouTube DL library. And I can import this third party YouTube library as well. Okay, so again, when we try to like um, scale up the type of task we're doing, we always try to start with a smaller problem first. So the smaller problem first that we're trying to do is we're trying to download a YouTube video. So, um, if you were to just visit YouTube DL's uh, documentation on GitHub, they actually have like sample code that tells you how to like download from like a YouTube DL. So over here, you can just run this code. I actually just copied it from like YouTube, YouTube DL's documentation. You don't have to really understand what it does sometimes. Sometimes you don't, as long as you roughly get how it works, you're able to like write, write code in it. And if you were to just run it, you will see that it's like downloading um, this test video, okay? So this is a test video from YouTube DL's documentation. Actually, let me just open up the documentation at the moment so that I can show everyone how to like just browse through it. Okay, YouTube DL, then you'll be able to see like the source code of it. So uh, over here, yeah, over here you can like just, um, let me just show, let me just search for this line so that I can just jump to exactly where it does. Okay, so um, yeah, from a Python program, you can embed YouTube DL in a more powerful fashion. So this is like one of the sections in like the develop one of the in the README. So basically, what I did was I basically just copy and pasted it over here. And if I were to just run it, it shows that you know if I were to, to just refresh over here, it actually downloaded the test video. Okay. Like if you download this file here and you download this file from Collab, it actually downloaded a test video of like YouTube DL. Okay, so th this looks pretty easy and it works, but it's a video, so how do we convert it, download it as an MP3 file now? So um, 
I actually like just read through like the documentation and you know you're, you're actually able to specify how you want to download it as so after like reading through the documentation you come to the conclusion that to download it as like an mp3 file you can just specify that you want it to be an mp3 file okay so you can just run the same thing and after it downloads it and you were to just refresh, refresh it you will see like there's this new file here and this new file here is actually a mp3 uh sorry yeah mp3 file okay uh the text are very small and i'm not sure you can see it but this is actually an mp3 file so it's like a music file at the moment so now that we managed to download the mp3 file of just one video we can actually use the links that we had earlier and we can just download all of them okay so right now I fed it a, a whole bunch of links. And okay, if I do just refresh it, you will see like um we have Rick Ashley never gonna give you up mp3 and we have the dark song mp3. And you will to just download it from collab. You can actually hear that you know it's actually the, the actual video, but it's just the audio of the video. Okay, so uh, then right now it's downloading like coffin dance. It's downloading like this, uh, you know the the she hua piao piao song that was quite viral last year. So yeah, this is just something that you can try it out on your own. The notebook link is uh, with with everyone. Okay, and actually that is like most of the most of what I wanted to cover for this uh, workshop. I'm just gonna end it off now. Okay, so where do we go after this, right? So. After this, uh, like I said, I hope that today what we've covered actually equips you with the skill to be able to just explore things on your own and think about what problems you face day to day. Okay, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to think of something that allows you to do some automation. And, and now with now that you guys know how to use like third-party libraries, how to use Python to like do this kind of thing, you will be able to like, you know, make your life better. So there's this book that's very popular over here. Okay, there's this book that's called Automate the Boring Stuff. Um, it's actually a free book that is released under the Creative Commons license. So it's a very popular book when we talk about Python automation. And, but you don't have to buy the book. It's actually free to read under a Creative Commons license. So over here, we can look for like, um, you, you learn how to use Python to write program that do in minutes, what will take you hours to do. Okay, basically it's in essence what we're trying to teach today. And um, like some of the things that you might learn in this book is like, you know, how to split PDFs and encrypt PDFs, how to like format data in Excel spreadsheets. So you can just check it out. Okay, it, it looks pretty cool. Um, disclaimer, I, I haven't actually read the book, but this is the book that everybody recommends when it comes to like automating stuff with Python. So you can just look at the, I, I briefly look at the table of contents, you know, they, talk about things like sending emails or even text messages, then uh, controlling the mouse and keyboard with GUI. So uh, um, one of the things that you can do, for example, suppose like some of you guys perhaps at work, you use things like Microsoft Teams or you use things like uh, Slack or Metamost. So you know that there's always that icon that keeps track of whether you're, you're online or not. And if you left the computer for a while, then you will like, um, and not become showing that you are busy or like you are away from your computer, right? So suppose you wanted to like go, you you had some urgent thing to attend to, and I don't know somehow or whether you want to pretend that you are still at work, then you can actually write a Python script that moves your mouse constantly to, and to make it constantly show that you are online, for example. So there's some things that you could do with like, uh, Python. Okay, so yeah, so essentially that's what. Essentially, Python is just so powerful. There's so many different things you can do with it. You can work with spreadsheets, you can work with data, you can manipulate images, everything, just explore it on your own. This book is kind of useful. All right. And like other third party libraries that's kind of cool is like there's like Django, there's like Flask. So uh, we are not going to cover it in this workshop, uh, but if you're interested in like data analysis with NumPy or Pandas, uh, then you can come for the workshop two weeks later. And if you are interested in like um, making a Telegram bot come for next week's workshop. All right. So um, yeah, we have come to the end of this workshop. There's this uh, feedback form that if you're still here, you'll be 
great if you could just like fill up this uh, feedback form to give us some feedback on how we can improve our teaching. And if you're interested in next week's workshop on like creating Telegram bots with Python, just uh, fill up this form over here. So I'm just going to send these links in Zoom chat as well. Uh, and, and yeah, I am sending the Telegram bot sign up form. So I hope today's workshop has been useful for you. Like I said, you know, I really do hope that the skills you've learned today will like make your life better. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the Zoom chat now. I'll answer them. All right, so. So I guess this brings us to the end of our workshop. Uh, as Chris mentioned, thank you very much for coming and please do attend the next workshop if you're interested in creating Telegram bots with Python. And do fill up the feedback link to find out or to, to help us understand what we can do better in such workshops. Thank you everyone and have a good weekend ahead. Yeah, have a good